19th century Africa, Southern Africa, especially South Africa and Rhodesia, are interesting, interesting places. Um, and I have, a, I, have a, I have a passion for those areas. I, I quite like the history of those areas. And the first video I wanted to make on the subject, I wanted to make about something that is not only about South African history. It's not only about um, that Southern African history, I should say. But it's also something that I think is a quite a unique example in history. And as far as I'm aware, what I'm going to be discussing in this video is the best kill to death ratio in history. I'm, I'm going to make that bold claim now. And I'm going to, I'm going to stand by that claim. And I, I challenge anybody to show me a battle with a better kill death ratio. Anyway, that's, that's now. Let's check out the Battle of Blood River. So before we can fight a battle, we have to bother with the uh, the political uh, uh, um, prelude uh, nonsense uh, backstory. I think would be the best best way to say it. Eighteen thirty-seven, Pete Retief, a Vortrekker, uh, a Vortrekker bore. I'm, I'm butchering the pronunciation. A Vortrekker is a later term, sort of eighteen eighties. Basically, this is a boer, a uh, an Afrikaner farmer, a um, who is moving north uh, out of the Cape Colony because the Cape Colony, of course. The British decided, well, we'll just have that. And the Boers, uh, fiercely independent, decided to move. Now, that's obviously a ridiculous oversimplification. The British was not the only reason they were moved. There was also you know, land and diamonds and all sorts of things. But but these people were Vortrekkers. Vortrekkers. And uh, they moved into the Zulu area. Um, and they signed a treaty with King Degane. I'm going to, I'm butchering the pronunciation, but Degane of the Zulu. And they signed this treaty. Um, Pete Retief and his, uh, his sort of escort, and then the uh, the king said to them, "Oh, why don't you come into the royal kraal, and I'll sh my warriors will show you a, a dance that we do, a uh, you know a ceremonial dance." And so the 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 Vortrekker Boers handed over all their rifles and their, all their muskets, sorry, and they went into the king's kraal, where they were clubbed to death, and then just left to rot on a hill, for vultures because uh, King Dagane liked to leave his enemies' corpses for the vultures. So that happened. Um, he, yeah, Pete Retief and his uh, men were killed. Uh, the deal that they had struck was actually in his, uh, he had a knapsack, a sort of bag, with the treaty in it that was found after. So that's the reason we know that that treaty was signed. It was official, it was legitimate. We actually know what it was. The, um, the Zulu wanted to get uh, 700 head of cattle back from the Tolokwa, tribe. So a different African tribe had stolen Zulu cattle. The Zulu went to Pete Retief and his men, look, if you get the cattle back, we will give you land settled. So they made a treaty. It was not theft. And then they were double-crossed and murdered. So on the 6th of February, 1838, after signing the treaty, Retief and his party were invited to watch a performance of the Zulu warriors, but instead they were murdered with a king yelling, quote, kill the sorcerers, end quote. The, yeah, the, uh, the Zulu believed that they were magic users. This would actually come up in the Matabili War. I believe the second Matabili War was started because of the, uh, the Matabili, uh, certain witch doctor, uh, sorcerer elements, had accused the British of causing droughts, famines, and all sorts of things. So this is a common theme in Africa. This is not something that can be written off as sort of uh, revisionism. I, I fully believe that to be the actual justification. So after Retief and his uh, Vortrekker uh, group were killed, the Zulu sent war parties to attack Vortrekker wagons, which resulted in the Winin Massacre, with uh, 534 Boer men, women, and children were killed by, uh, by the Ghana Zulus. And it's important that we say the Ghana Zulus. Um, this is the event that sort of sets up the Zulus to be another monolithic group again. So we have Shaka Zulu, he, his death by his brother. Yeah, his brother kills him. The Zulus sort of fracture a little bit. The Ghana is becoming the top dog Zulu, the sort of uh, head of the Zulus, but he is fractured, and the power is fractured there. And there are a few princes, and then there is another gentleman who we're going to meet later, and that's a very important incident. So the Vortrek, the, the Vortrekkers have been killed at, Winin, at the Winin Massacre. So after the massacre, and a few other small events, Boer Commandant General Andres Pretorius, uh, Pretoria in South Africa is named for Pretorius, he was a very famous man, 
he got 600, uh, about, sorry, he got 460 commandos, which was um, Boers, pretty much, Boers who were, uh, went out with muskets, and they actually had two carronades, and a carronade sounds quite impressive, it's not, it's sort of like a sawn-off shotgun version of a cannon, um, if you imagine you take a cannon, shorten it, slightly thicken it a little bit, it's a, it's almost like a grape shot shotgun cannon. And they knocked up some homemade carriages for these, and they set out with uh, wagons to uh, to engage Dingane. Uh, Dingane. I'm going to butcher that. Sorry, I do apologise. And I'm going to say that the they fought Dingane rather than Zulu because um, believe me, uh, Dingane is much harder to say than Zulu. I think we can all pronounce Zulu. We've all seen the movies. Uh, the Boer actually had an alliance with a man named Mapande, who was another Zulu prince. Uh, and this is this is the man I was talking about earlier, Mapande. This is a very pivotal moment for the Zulu tribe. So Mapande is sort of the the rogue, challenging, wants to be the king of the Zulu. And Tagane and a few other princes sort of uh, um, have power over him. So Mapande makes a deal with the Vortrekkers. He says, right, you don't even have to kill Depande or Degande. Sorry, you don't have to kill him. You have to destabilize him enough so that we can come in, take him out, take over the Zulu area, and we will give you an area which would then became Natalia. More on that later. He would allow the Vortrekkers to move and settle in the sort of area, so the thing. So all of this is about, it initially starts with uh, Retief trying to make a deal for land. Not stealing, trying to make a deal. He's betrayed, so the Boers then go... Right, so we still want to make a deal, and we want to avenge our murdered kin. Remember these these Vortrekkers, these Boers, these Afrikaners. They have this very powerful sense of uh, religiosity, and very uh, these are very Christian people. These are very dedicated, hardworking people. And to them, this this vengeance to to just leave this unchecked is is you know. And so they say, okay, we'll make another deal. We do trust these Zulu, so we'll make another deal with Mapande, and hopefully this will work out. So the Boers sent a flight commando. It became later known as a flight commando, which is basically men on horseback, no wagons. That's important later, we'll get to that. And uh, they sent this flight commando out and they thought, right, we'll do a lightning raid. We'll do the, we'll do a blitzkrieg almost. Obviously a horribly modern word, but you know, a blitzkrieg will target them and get them fast. This didn't work. Uh, several of the commandos were killed. Um, the, the reason this was such a weird thing to do is is normally in South Africa and Southern Africa, sorry, you would form a lager. And what you would do is you would get your wagons and you'd have wooden barricades and at night you would form a lager, which is you put all the wagons in a circle. Uh, similar things we done in the American West too. This is where the uh, the idea actually came from. You would form your wagon your wagons into a lager, into a circle, and you would uh, you would fortify that area and that would be a defense against uh, Zulu, against predators, against animals, also against other you know, all sorts of things. This was a protected position. So these flight commandos did not have a defensive position to fall back to. They were relying completely on speed, and it, it did not work. So they retreated, uh, went back to uh, Pretorius, and planned another mission. So with his four-pounder and six-pounder carronade, we know about one of them. We do not know about the other. We assume the other was a... I believe we assume the other was a six. But essentially, he had two small carronades. And he set out to fight... Dingane. Um, no, the, the, the important thing to remember here is nobody is incompetent. This isn't like a, a crack Boer commando force of, of World War II SAS troops fighting against these, these peasants in Russia or whatever. This is a very mili this is a militarized society. Since Shaka Zulu militarized the Zulu, these are a military society up against Boers who are not a military society, but they are people whose who military is part of their life. They aren't professional, but fighting is something they have to do to survive. And so Dingana gave his troops two major orders. These two orders were things they must not do. Number one, do not attack the Boers while they are in a lager. That was the big, don't do it. Wait until they are out of the lager. The plan was to get them to move across the attack, uh, the the plan was to get them to move across the rough Italini terrain. So these, this Italini terrain had to be single fire wagons. They could not form a lager. And their horses would be much less maneuverable. Their routes would be cut off by sort of the terrain, the rocks, distances. Their, their muskets would not be able to shoot very far. 
because obviously if you have dips in the ground you can duck down you can hide you can hide quite a lot of men in a very shallow dip even if it only is 10 feet deep you can hide men in that so this Italini this was the, the, the crux of where the, the of where Dingane wanted the troops to enter where he would attack them and a second big big order he gave was do not attack the Boers during the day you must attack them in you must not attack them in a lager and you must not attack them during the day so keep that in mind now commandant general pretorius was not a fool either and instead of going into the rough terrain he camped 40 kilometers away on the banks of the ninkome soon to be called the blood river um which guarded one of his flanks near an area near the hippo pool which was very deep it was pretty much impervious and if anybody tried to cross it they would simply be shot um, the river itself was fordable. It was just the area immediately near the camp that was that was quite deep and well guarded. Um, and to his front was a wide open plain. The, if you wanted to charge him, you, you were more than welcome to because you had no cover whatsoever. So on December the 15th, 20,000 Zulus lined the banks of the Ninkome River and waited for morning. And um, that, that's important. Remember, do not attack them during the day. Here they are waiting for morning. Do not attack them in a lager. Here they are, waiting to attack them in a fortified lager, which is even worse. The Boers swore a vow. They swore a vow to God himself. If he delivered them victory, they would celebrate the day for all time and build church, uh, build a church for him. Um, spoiler alert, the, uh, the holiday actually still occurs in South Africa to this day, but it's been renamed Reconciliation Day rather than, uh, the, than the initial name. So, Dingane Zulu warriors had already broken their first order. Do not attack the Boers in Lager. They were going to attack the Boers in Lager, in the Lager. Since the Boers were not going to move, they had plenty of drinking water. They had plenty of uh, food. They could just sit there and let Mampande's Zulus target the camp. So these, these Boers had to be dealt with so that the Panes warriors could return to their, um, their capital and defend it from Mpande. That's another very important thing to remember. Um, the next bit is a bit controversial. Okay, so why did they attack during the day remember do not attack during the day the zulus of, of depande attacked during the day uh, historians are a bit iffy on this one one camp says well they wanted to get as many men across the river as possible and they just they only had about 10,000 of their 20,000 troops across the river and so they waited till daylight before they launched the attack um this one's a bit weird for me i'm not 100 i do not 100 buy this reason I think the second reason is actually more, um, slightly more plausible. Uh, if you had only got half your troops across, why would you not just wait another day to get the other half? It's only one day. It, it doesn't make much sense. But the, the, other, the other example, the other reason, sorry, is the Boers would hang whip sticks. Uh, they would have a whip stick on the front of their wagons, and they would hang lanterns from them at night to, uh, to illuminate the areas around them. And there was a belief among the Zulu that these whipstick lanterns were uh, were charms that would ward off evil and they would keep the Boers safe. And if you attack this lager at night with those lanterns up, then then you were certain to die. You were certain to be killed. So that was a sort of superstition. A lot of people write that off as saying, oh, you know, superstition. But the Zulu had just spent a few days performing spells to uh, make their warriors bulletproof and strong and tough. So... To me, if you if you perform spells, it's it, you can't write your behavior off as being superstitious. So, so I'm I'm more inclined to believe the second, but you can of course believe whatever you like. It won't change the reality. So, so the 16th of December, 1838, the forces of Dingane Dingane attacked with between seven and a half to ten thousand. I've read so many sources that say ten, and I've read a lot of websites that say seven and a half to ten. Um, 10 seems to be the, the most uh, numerous number that I've come across personally. 7.5 seems to be this sort of thing people throw in there because they have to be uncertain about things. It's, it's quite bizarre. Um, so the Boers, we're familiar with, with Zulus attacking a fortified encampment. We've all seen Zulu, where the British with their Martini Henrys, professional soldiers with professional Martini Henry rifles, breech loaders, hold off the Zulu. The Boers at Blood River have smoothbore muskets, the same as would have been used in Napoleon, the American Revolution. Smoothbore, single-shot, flintlock muskets. And so, 
these farmers who were, were crack shots because because when you're in the African belt, when you're in the African bush, you can't just bring wagon loads of powder with you. So you have to have powder with you enough to train and shoot with. You also have to get rid of pests. You have to hunt for food. So these people became precise shots with their muskets out of necessity. So these were good shots. And so that's what it was. It was Zulu with cow high shields and short and assegai short spears. That would come up later. Against farmers with uh, smooth bore flintlock muskets. No bayonets that I can uh, that we can that we know of. So the Zulu charged the Boers in their lager, and something quickly became apparent. Um, Shaka Zulu had taken away the throwing spears of the Zulu warriors, and he cut replaced them with cut down assegai stabbing spears. But what happened was the Zulus were stalled outside the camp. The the Boers set up big stick. Uh, sticker bush type um, thorn bush type things and they had fortified the the lager quite well I mean, the boars the sorry the Zulu could not get close enough to engage the boars in melee combat and so the Zulu retreated uh, if they had throwing spears maybe they could have sort, uh, put up more of a fight so the Zulu retreat after the first attack the boars reload um, they have to conserve their ammunition but they're doing quite well so as the Zulus retreat, Boer commandos on horses ride out and harass them, but they don't go too far. They just want to keep the Zulus sort of retreating. They don't want to drive them. They don't want to, to um, get caught out in the open. And so the Boer commandos come back, and the Zulu come back for a second attack. And the same thing happens again. And they retreat, and the Boers sort of chase them out, and they come back. And then the third time, the Zulus come on, and again they push back. And then the fourth time, it's sort of late afternoon, the Zulu were uh, are, are getting quite desperate at this point, and they charge the lager, and they put up a great fight, and they get thrown back. And at this time, Pretorius, Pretorius realizes, if I do not do something now, the Zulu are gonna, they're, they're going to get the rest of their army across this river. They're going to, they're going to have me tomorrow. I've completely run out of ammunition. I've, oh, sorry, I've almost completely run out of ammunition. I need to get out. So with 300 commandos on horseback, Pretorius charged the Zulus. He charged with no swords, just muskets, most of them unloaded, and they pursued the Zulus across the river, and they pushed them back, and they forced them out. And the Zulus fled in panic. Uh, they believed that the, the Boers were with a vengeance coming after them, and they pushed them across the river. And it was at this time that the river ran red with blood. Supposedly it ran red with blood. And this is when it was renamed to Blood River, hence the name Battle of Blood River. Now, at the start of this video, I made the claim that I believe this battle has the best kill-to-death ratio of any battle in history. So here it is. Over 3,000 Zulu were dead on the banks of the Blood River. Among them were the, were the two major princes, which was good news for Andala, because it meant that he pretty much had no real challenges to his claim for the Zulu crown. So if he could take out Dimbande... That was him set for life. So, how many men did the Boers lose? They started to four successful attacks, and they made three minor sorties and a quite major sortie. Um, I'll let you have a little guess of how many men do you think were killed and wounded on the Boers? Well, let's start with wounded. Uh, two men were wounded, uh, alongside with General Pretorius himself. Uh, General Pretorius was wounded in the hand as uh, by an assegai during the final sortie. So if the commanding officer's wounded, that must mean it was pretty serious close fighting. It was a real close thing, right? So how many Boers died? Well, nothing. No Boers were killed. No Boers. Not one of the single 464 men were dead. None of their servants were dead. No one who came along with them were dead. Three men were wounded to 3,000 Zulu casualties. So essentially this had a death rate of Three men wounded to 3,000 dead. So a one wounded to 1,000 dead ratio. I challenge you to find one better than that. Although I do I do uh, acknowledge that Bembezi came close, but that was with Maxim machine guns. So that is kind of cheating. But uh, anyway. So with these Zulus in full retreat, uh, Andala wins the Battle of Makonke. Makonge. And he takes the crown for the new crown. And he takes the crown from Dimbande and he crowns himself the king of the Zulu. 
and he negotiates in good faith and he f completely lives up to his side of the agreement there is no trade-up there is no backstabbing he gives Pretorius and his Boers his Vortrekkers the Republic of Natalia this great Boer Republic that would last for uh, four years four years but it was annexed by the British Empire and the Boers once again trek north to found the Transvaal and the Orange Free State but uh We'll get to that later. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope this video was interesting. Please leave a like and comment below. I'll read and reply to them all, if you know, reasonable. And let me know what kind of content you'd like to see in the future. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.